obviously you weren't there, but right. when someone ejaculates in someone's mouth, they either spit it out or swallow it, right? I'm not saying you're an expert in that field. <laughs> <laughs> It'll get all over the table. <laughs> or it absorbs. Okay, but yeah. as a general rule, somebody will either spit it out, I would think, or swallow it, right? Yes. So if someone spits it out, there's a good chance you would get semen, like either on the body or on the clothes, uh, or just somewhere on, on that person or the other person, right? It all depends on where it goes. Sure, but that's a good chance, correct? How's your day? Oh my God, it's so hot uh, yes. already. It's so hot outside. No, no, but I was on the uh, motorcycle right and it's just. Oh, go. You have to go to the restaurant? Right at the headquarters. It's all the construction, sure. so it's a little detour. Because I have not walking anyway. over here. <laughs> yeah, just that. And then you come in here, like, gotta look nice and not look like you're a sweaty pig or something. Yeah. I had to leave that part in because it is so relatable, but at the same time, I could not imagine the Texas heat. I have to hide for the first half hour once I get to work because it's at least a 15-minute walk from the car to the building, then to whatever office. My air conditioning was broke this summer. I am Scandinavian, Polish, and German, so that nice pale, see-through skin, lol. So by the time I make it to my destination, I'd be so red-faced and gross, I'd need a bit to simmer down. I hope that everyone had a uh, nice lunch and it wasn't too hot outside. All right. Uh, we're still on, uh, I believe, recross. We were speaking with Officer Sandoval and right before our break, I believe that Officer Sandoval was reading from a two-year-old police report and he testified as to possible use of force. Was there use of force in your police report by my defendant? No, there wasn't. So anything that may have been stated right before we broke for lunch would have been a simple error. Is that correct? Yes, sir. No further questions. All right, uh, State, any further questions? No further questions, Your Honor. Is this witness excused or subject to recall? Excuse from the State. At this point, we're going to say subject to recall, but we will probably not need it. But at this point, for safety's sake, I'll say subject to recall. All right. Uh, the rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state and defense. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right. State, call your next witness. State calls Linda Witte. And if you could state your name for the record. Linda Witte. All right. And just make sure you keep your voice up so that the court report and the uh, jurors can hear. All right. State. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Ms. Witte. How, how are you employed? I am a registered nurse. Uh, sexual assault nurse examiner. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your training experience. Um, what are the steps to become a, a certified sexual assault nurse examiner? First of all, you have to be have a license, a registered nurse in the state of Texas, and uh, to be a SANE in Texas. And you have to be a registered nurse for two years with experience in trauma, and then go through the SANE training. The same training consists of 80 hours of classroom, and then there's a series of things that you have to go through, um, 16 hours of courtroom experience, uh, 10, no, eight, eight, eight sexual assault exams, 10 speculum exams, and then we spend time with an OB-GYN doctor, and that is to get the initial certification by the state of Texas. Okay, and so we've been hearing and be using the word SANE. Uh, is that an abbreviation for something? It is. SANE stands for Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner. And um, so you said all those things that you talked about were to get the initial certification. Correct. And what do you have to do in order to maintain that um, certification? So we have to recertify every two years, and that is separate from our registered nurse uh, licensure. We do 20 hours of education minimum, with eight hours of that being case reviews, um, 10 sexual assault exams. Okay. And um, as far as you being a SANE, how long have you been a SANE? I've been a SANE for 13 years. And has it always been here in San Antonio? No, it has not. Previous to becoming a uh, or being a saint here in San Antonio, where were you a uh, saint at? I did my initial training and then uh, worked as a saint in Midland, Texas, in West Texas. Okay. How long were you a saint out in Midland? Approximately two years. Okay. And then when did you come to San Antonio? 2011. Okay. And have you been a saint since 2011? I am still a saint, correct. So since 2011 till today, you are 
your only profession is the same. Correct. As far as where you're currently employed, um, what hospital do you work out of? We are at Methodist Specialty and Transplant Hospital. If you can, just for the jury's sake, generally describe what is the purpose of a SANE or a SANE exam? The purpose of a SANE exam is to um, give comprehensive care to the patient that has been sexually assaulted. Um, along with that, taking care of the psychosocial needs, the safety needs, as well as taking a narrative that leads to the SANE exam itself, which is a medical forensic exam. Okay. And your years um, as a SANE nurse, how do you know about approximately how many SANE exams you have completed? Over 1,350. Um, when... As far as um, make, making records in this case, or in any case, um, when you're doing your examination, um, do you make a record and keep a record as it relates to that examination? Yes, I do. And are you the custodian of records of those of those records? Yes, I'm one of the custodian of the records. I'm a custodian of my own record. Okay. And did you bring some records here with you today? I did. And are those records that you brought with you today, are you the custodian of those records? I am. And do those records relate to a uh, patient by the name of Sarah Bundariano? They do. And are those records, are they kept in the uh, ordinary course of business of Methodist, Transplant, Methodist Specialty and Transplant Hospital? Yes. Um, and at the time, uh, at or near the time that those records are made, um, do you have knowledge of the events that are occurring? Yes. Okay. So you're making notations within the record as you're no noting them? Yes. Um, and these records contain your personal observations? They do. do they contain um, oh, like things like uh, medical history uh, and results of certain uh, the exam? They do. You want me to approach? Yes. Is it okay if I staple these records together? Yes. Is that going to change within the, in the records? No. I didn't know who you were asking. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm showing you what you brought with you, which I have marked as uh, States Exhibit Number Seven for identification purposes. <clears throat> those are the <clears throat> those are the records that we just spoke about, right? They are. Um, and when was the examination on Sarah um, Quindriano completed? March the thirtieth, two thousand twenty. Your Honor, at this time, State would move to admit States Exhibit Number Seven, tendering to defense for objections to any as previously tendered in electronic discovery. All right, state's exhibit number seven is admitted. Yes, <clears throat> What is the purpose of taking a um, medical history when it, in, the, in the context of a same exam? The medical history will alert me to things to look out for. Um, <clears throat> side effects of some of the medicines she may be on some of the physical things I may see because of her medical history. Um, and it's taking a history important for an accurate medical treatment and diagnosis. It is. So did you take a history from the um, from Sarah in this case? Do you mean the medical history? Yes. Yes, I did. And as far as, is there a difference in types of histories that you're taking? There is. Okay. Can you describe for the jury the difference in this, I guess, the two types of histories? So the medical history is asking what medical problems she has had in the past. I ask also what surgeries she's had, what pregnancies. And then we also call the history, the narrative. And that is um, writing down what she says happens, what she said happened. And then that leads me into knowing where to look for trauma, where to look for evidence. So in talking about it, I think you called it a narrative, that part of the history about what has happened to her. Did you take that as well from Sarah? I did. And again, is that narrative, the narrative history, is that important in making an accurate medical treatment and diagnosis? Very important. Okay. Um, when you get a history from, and I should say, let's start at the beginning of the same exam. What is the first step when somebody is brought to Methodist Specialty and Transplant Hospital for a voluntary SANE exam? The first thing is that they're seen medically in the emergency room. 
they're seen by a physician and any injury that needs to be treated gets treated anything that needs to be x-rayed any lab work that needs to be done and then she gets offered she or he gets offered prophylaxis for sexually transmitted diseases and anything else that needs to be done medically we consult with the doctor on what needs to be done in that case once she is cleared medically then we do the forensic exam okay. so when you get to the forensic exam what's the first step so we always have uh, we do it as a team we get an advocate from rape crisis center and a chaplain so there's three people on the team in the room and then the first thing is to get consent from her and it is consent to uh, obtain evidence and turn it over to law enforcement and that's the first page of this record and then when it comes to the history what i tell her is tell her or him i say this is where you are painting the picture for law enforcement and you're painting the picture for me and this tells me where to look for evidence where to look for trauma i'll try not to interrupt you uh, the only reason I would interrupt you would be to ask you to slow down. And then I write down word for word in quotes what she says. Okay. So after you take a history, if I'm understanding your testimony correctly, then that will guide your, um, your examination. It does. Okay. After the history, we do the head to toe assessment. So in this case, what specifically about her history, I guess, guided your uh, examination? Specifically, she did not in her story. In her story, she did not say that there was any um, penile vaginal penetration. So that led me to not do a genital exam on her. So in this case, you did not do a genital exam. Correct. So um, in her allegations, if you need to refer to your record, please do. What type of sexual contact, if any, did she allege? There was penile oral, his penis in her mouth. Okay. And in talking with her, were you able to get an estimated time frame of when that happened? I was. Okay. And is getting that time frame important for... Um, medical treatment and diagnosis, as well as um, any potential biological evidentiary value? It is. Why is that? For, for evidence, it's important because in the oral cavity in the mouth, evidence can be destroyed or passed on quite rapidly because of saliva, because of eating, because the mouth is continually being washed and cleaned. Um, so that's forensically, and also because if I do see injury, I need to know the time frame. There are certain injuries that you could see in the mouth. In this case, uh, if you could remind the jury, what date did you see her on? March the 30th. And you're approximately what time? 1600, which is 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And so based on her coming in, were you able to determine by hours approximately how many hours had elapsed since the uh, sexual assault? 18 hours. 18 hours in this case, um, based on her statement. I should back up for a second. Are there things that would affect uh, any collection uh, or possible collection of biological evidence? There are many things that can affect that collection. Okay. As it relates to uh, penile oral penetration. What things are you looking at that might guide you as to whether you expect to find any biological evidence? Time that has passed, whether she's brushed her teeth, whether she's used mouthwash, whether she's eaten, whether she's had fluid. Okay. And in this case, did any of those things um, exist that might um, change uh, what you might expect to receive as far as evidence? She had fluid. Okay. So um, in this case also, did she tell you whether um, the perpetrator had ejaculated? She did tell me. Okay. And what did she say about that? Mm -hmm. 
he ejaculated in her mouth. So taking her narrative history of having 18 hours previously had somebody ejaculated in her mouth and then having fluids in that 18 hours in your, was it 1300 um, stain exams based on your training experience, would you expect to find biological evidence? I would not, but I went ahead and tried anyway because that is the only place that she said they had been exposure. Okay. So you're still going to take a swab? Yes. Um, but that is just in hopes that there might be something. Correct. But from what I'm understanding, you didn't wouldn't expect to. I would not. Um, as far as any other type of sexual contact, did she make any other types of allegations? In her narrative, she did. There was some touching outside of the clothing. So therefore, I did not um, do an exam underneath the clothing. Okay. Um, so did you take any other swabs in this case? I did. Okay. And where on her body um, did you take these swabs? Perioral, which means around the mouth her left cheek, her left breast, and her neck, and her abdomen on the left side. Okay. As far as the perioral swabs, is that something you would do in every case? If there has been uh, penile contact or even mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact because of saliva and semen that could be around the mouth and doesn't always get washed off from eating or drinking. Okay. So is that why you took that swab? It is, and also because of what she said. What did she say that also made you take that swab? He kissed me on my mouth and my left cheek. Okay. So um, moving on to the next swab, which would be the left cheek swab. Um, is that the reason that you took that particular swab? It is. Okay. Um, as far as the less left breast swabs, why did you take those swabs? She said, quote, he kissed my breast. Okay. And so... Um, moving on to the neck swabs. Um, why did you take neck swabs? Quote, he kissed my neck. Okay. And then finally going on to the left abdomen swabs. Quote, he kissed me there. Out of all of the history that you took in the mechanism of, you know, kissing, uh, mouth, oral contact there, would you necessarily expect any of these to leave some type of biological evidence? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Okay. So the fact that biological evidence is not there does not mean that something didn't happen. Correct. Um, as far as um, kind of going back to how you conduct these examinations, you first do the consent, right? And then you take a medical history and then a narrative history. And that guides your actual physical examination, right? Correct. So in this case, is there anything else about her physical examination that you completed? I looked with an alternate light source. Okay. And what's the point of looking with an alternate light source? So an alternate, it, an alternate light source is like a black light, but it, ha, it operates on a different wavelength. And what you're doing is wiping out, blocking, some of the light so that uh, other light might fluoresce. Fluoresce means to, to shine. It shines under the light. And what we're looking for is dried secretions to know where to swab. Um, and then after you do the alternative light source, are you, do you collect any other evidence or potential evidence in this case? I do. And what type of evidence are you trying to collect? So I do my exam, physical exam, head to toe, and I collect evidence at the same time. So um, we, I collect the oral, that means in the mouth, swab first, because I'm trying to get foreign DNA. Then I will come back in about 15 minutes to collect the buccal swab, which is scraping the inside of her cheeks. That's getting her DNA to compare with what I might find. And then I look for injury, 
um, back up a little bit, I look under the alternate light source first, and then I do the head to toe assessment. And then I look for injuries. I'm looking in the eyes and the ears, looking for signs of trauma, looking in the back of the mouth and the throat, moving down, looking for bruises, looking for scratches, abrasions, all the way head to toe. In this case, I did not do the genital exam. So after you've done that physical examination of her, um, other than the swabs that we've already talked about, um, did you collect any other evidence in this case? Or I did. What was that? She had changed her clothing, but I kept her bra and her white blouse. Okay. Um, at, in your same record, um, I believe that it is... Um, on page three of six, when it refers to um, treatment provided. Um, it notates that there's antibiotic prophylaxis that was given. What, can you explain just generally, what is the antibiotic prophylaxis? This is to prevent the patient from getting sexually transmitted diseases, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Was she administered prophylaxis in this case? She was. Um, and uh, again, that was, I guess, how many prophylactics was she given? She was given three different antibiotics as well as medicine to keep her from getting nauseated from those antibiotics. Um, and is that pretty standard based on the history that you were given in this case? Yes, it is. So at what point is that treatment provided? That is in the emergency room before she gets to me. In dealing with, um, in your in your training experience and, and history of working on these types of cases, um, have you found that victims always react in the same way? No. And when you talk with the victims and just very, very broadly speaking, um, when you get narrative histories from them, do they always have the same demeanor? They do not. Their demeanors differ as much as their stories do. Um, if somebody were to have a flat affect or demeanor, um, is that something that you've come across within your practice? Many times. Um, is that consistent based on your history um, with somebody who's been sexually assaulted? It is. Um, in this case, when you talked with uh, Sarah, do you remember what her demeanor was like? I do. What was it like? I documented she was alert, oriented, soft-spoken, relates history without difficulty. I remember... Sarah, when I saw her pictures, and I remembered that she did have a flat affect. I can't document flat affect because they want us to document what you actually see, and flat is a not a very descriptive term, but I remembered that she did not show a great deal of emotion. And in your history, is that concerning with her veracity for truthfulness? Not at all. And was her affect similar to patients you've dealt with in the past? Yes, everyone is different. It's like every person has a cocktail of neurohormones that are released during the time of crisis. Your cocktail is different than mine, <laughs> different than hers, different from everyone. And um, one person may laugh. I tend to laugh under crisis. That is oxytocin. Another person may show no emotion at all. Some fight. You've heard of fight and, and flight. There's also fawn. I'll do anything I can to survive this. And there's freeze. And a person doesn't have control over how he or she is going to respond in that moment. 
So in your history and dealing with people, is it is it your experience that most victims fight back? No. Is it within your practice um, most frequent that they run? You see a little bit of everything, but I think the most frequent is freeze. Okay. And by freeze, what specifically do you mean by that? Sometimes they don't say anything. They just don't move. Um, so after you finish collecting, you do your physical examination, you collect the clothing, what do you do next? I assess what the needs are. So I'm now thinking about what resource she's gonna need, what her safety. And I'm also evaluating the stability. Um, so often when they do freeze or they do anything but run, they feel guilty, like it's all their fault. So I'm dealing with those emotions and trying to help them understand and put this crisis in perspective. At this time, I'll pass the witness. Defense. Uh, Ma'am, are you, uh, my name is Anthony Cantrell and I represent this young man here sitting next to me. Uh, you don't really know anything about him today, do you? I do not. Um, so as a SANE nurse, are you a registered nurse also? I am. And how long have you been a nurse? 40 years. Thank you for your service to our community. Thank you. Um, so you start out initially by doing an assessment of, of a person that comes in, right? Yes. And take a, a brief history of what happened, of, of why she's there. Yes. Okay. And then eventually you'll do a medical history. Yes. So your job is not to decide if somebody's telling the truth or not. Your job essentially is, is a fact taker, writing down what you see, taking down the history, and um, you're not there to determine if someone's lying or telling the truth. Isn't that right? That is correct. So when you took the brief history under number two of your report, and you can re refer to your report at any time if you'd like to, and, and if ever I ask a question, you need a little more time to answer it. By looking at your report, just please ask and I'll take all the time you need. Thank you. So uh, when uh, Sarah gave you this brief history of what had happened, she never at once told you that someone forced uh, her to have oral sex with someone. Isn't that right? Give me time. Yes, ma'am. May I read the narrative or how do you want me Just to answer? answer the question? You can look at the report and I asked you, did Sarah ever give you a history that someone uh, forced uh, her to give oral sex on another person? Yes. And and what is it? He wanted sex. I said no. Yeah. Where where do you find that uh, in that that someone forced her to have oral sex? It's not he there, is it? He asked me to do things. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Where Eventually, it, I did give him oral sex. Where did it say someone forced her to give oral sex? In this quote, no, I'm not going to do that. Eventually, I did give him oral sex. He finished. Answer my, my question again, nurse. I'm answering your question. Okay. I don't know where, how else to answer your where question. Where does it say that she said someone forced her to give oral sex on that person? On the I'm seventh line down. I'm going to object to ask the answer. All right, that will be overruled. Where does it say the, the term forced uh, to give oral sex? Where is that in that statement? No, I'm not gonna do that. Eventually I did give him oral sex. He finished in my mouth. Okay, so no, nowhere there does it say someone forced me to give oral sex. Isn't that true? The word force is not here, but she Thank said, no, much. I'm not going to do that. So, eventually, I did give him people. Oral people sex. say no all the time and then eventually decide to do something. Wouldn't you agree? No means no. Understood. But no means no. And then it can change to, OK, I'll do it. Right. 
I'm, I'm asking you that. I, I can only question. say what she told me. No, I'm not going to do that. Eventually, I did give him oral sex. Okay. And nowhere did it say he forced me to give him oral sex. The word force is not used there. All right. Thank you. Now, you go on to, uh, uh, now this is 18 hours later, right? Yes, it is. All right. So, um, did she take a bath? No, she did not. Did she shower? She did not. Did she brush her teeth? She did not. Did she use any mouthwash? She did not. So those were good signs, hoping that you might find a result if it was there, right? We ask those things no matter what. We ask those questions no matter what the history is, because we don't leave blanks. And it leads me to look for evidence. So the question was that if you're going to, if you're hoping to find evidence, you would want someone who hasn't bathed, showered, or brushed their teeth, or used mouthwash. Isn't that right, ma'am? That, that increases the chances of getting evidence. Was her underwear changed? No. So at some point, you started doing a medical exam, correct? That's what you testified to. Uh, head to toe physical assessment? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. <clears throat> did you find any injuries on her body anywhere? I did not. So that would be consistent with no trauma. Isn't that correct? I did not see trauma on her physical body. No bruising, correct? I did not see trauma. No laceration? There was no lacerations. So one of the things that after someone has a history of being ejaculated on is that you would do an assessment to see if you can find that. Isn't that correct? Correct. And one of the tools you use was uh, a fluorescent light type uh, instrument. Correct. And that's to, de to detect the presence of sperm. Isn't that right? Dried secretions. Could be sperm, could be saliva, could be sweat. Some type of DNA maybe. No, dried secretions. That would contain DNA, yes. Okay. Um, and you did, you did on, on the history you received, uh, checked uh, for presence of, let's just call it um, bodily fluids um, on Sarah's left cheek, anterior cheek, left breast, and left abdomen, abdomen, correct? Correct. And you found no evidence of any bodily fluids on those areas, did you? Did you not? That is not correct. What did you find? On the swabs on the neck, it did fluoresce and it disappeared with swabbing. Okay. So you found something, but you don't know what it was. Correct. But on those other areas, you did not find anything. There was no fluorescence. Did you also, uh, were those the swabs that you turned in for DNA, DNA testing? Yes, they were. Did you happen to get those results? I do not get those results. You never looked at them? I don't get those results. Do you know how to read a DNA test? I do not. Um, but you're familiar with scientific terms as a nurse for 40 years, right? I do, I'm not an expert in DNA, but the results go to the, the crime lab, gets the results, it goes to the detective, and we do not get the results. Understood. But you can read and write the English language, right? Of course. My approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Nurse Whitty, would you take a few minutes, please, to just refresh your memory on those, on that report? And if you I, could. I cannot. Refresh my memory. I've not seen this. Well, I'm asking you to look to at look it. at it, yes, not refresh, please. but look at it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for correcting me. I appreciate it. And can you tell us where those results, uh, the lab was that those results came from? Bear County Criminal Investigation Laboratory. Do you have any reason to doubt their authenticity? I do not. Uh, can you tell the jury whether or not those were consistent with the swabs that you? Uh, turned in? They are. And can you tell this court what the findings of the DNA uh, findings with, re with, result, with respect to the results 
of the swatch that you turned in. Judge, I'm going to object from her reading from a document that's not been admitted, as well as the lack of foundation. No, no, I'll Sustain. tender to uh, state. <clears throat> Your Honor, at this time, we tender defendant's exhibit number one for uh, jury review. Uh, is it, are you offering it into evidence? Yes. Judge, this lacks foundation. This is not the proper witness. Uh, she has no knowledge of the video. I defense exhibit number one, please. Yes. All right, with regards to defense exhibit number one, uh, state's uh, objection will be sustained. With, res with res uh, respect to the evidence received, um, and I'm talking about the oral swabs and the debris collection and a known standard. Would that be what you had submitted for testing uh, at the uh, Bear County Criminal Investigation Lab? I did. Okay. And uh, this is the first time you've seen that. It is. And so are you surprised that all the DNA testing results were negative? No, I'm not. So you're telling me that after Sarah, who had not showered, who had not bathed, who had not washed her teeth or brushed her teeth, um, and who testified that um, the perpetrator kissed her neck, her ab abdomen, and breast which you would think if someone did those things, they would leave saliva on those areas, um, that no DNA was found. Is that what you're gonna tell this jury? Uh, what's your question? My question was, is that Sarah told you that she had not bathed after this alleged incident occurred, accusing my client of this, that, uh, he had, she had not brushed her teeth, taken a shower. Um, and that not changed her underwear. And that she claims that my client kissed her on the neck, in the mouth, ejaculated in her mouth, uh, kissed her uh, abdomen. And all those areas that you took Schwab's of, the T DNA test came back negative to my client. That's what you saw, isn't it? When you that's what this? the report says. Okay. What is that your question? Yes, that's what the report said. Yes. So that's certainly very strong evidence that this man didn't do that. Isn't that right, ma'am? No, it is not. Okay. We often that, do not. That's, that's fine. I, I respect your opinion. But you will agree with me that DNA evidence is very important in a case. The DNA evidence, as well as the narrative, the narrative itself is the most important piece of evidence. Well, that's surprising. I thought you would say as your job that the medical examination would be the most important piece of information. Isn't that right? The, it's it's it, you can't say one evidence is more important than the other. The narrative is said. a very important piece of evidence, as well as the physical evidence that we get. I understand, nurse. I mean, this is your job. You do this all the time, and I'm sure you see a lot of cases that are disturbing to you. Um, but your job is to assess and give an accurate statement with respect to the evidence, right? The evidence that I take? Yes, Correct. So it's really not the narrative, because anyone can lie to you, it's the medical evidence that's the most important. Isn't that right, nurse? No, it is not. For legal reasons, perhaps, but for the care of my survivor, the narrative is extremely important and is in more important to me than the evidence that I take. And no one's ever lied to you. I can't say that. I don't, I don't know. It's not my job to ask, are you telling the truth? I write what that survivor tells me. 
Understood. Pass the witness. State. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Mr. Cantrell spent some time talking about force within the narrative portion of your report. So I want to talk about that for a second. Um, does force always have to be physical? It is not. Okay. Um, when he's asking you about force, what are you interpreting that to me? The way he asked me, he wanted, my understanding is he wanted me to say if forced was there in the narrative, the word was not there. Uh, she goes on to talk about verbal threat. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. So was, did she demonstrate to you or tell Objection, you that there was- Objection, Your Honor, that would be hearsay. It's- It's within uh, the report. And can I see states exhibit number seven, please? And can I have uh, both attorneys approach? Other than threats, did, were there any other, um, within her history, did she give you any other, um, and I'll give you a copy back of State Exhibit number seven. Did she tell you anything in her history that indicated the force was used? He asked me to do things. I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. Eventually I did give him oral sex. He finished in my mouth. I'm also looking in your narrative under section two, where it says, he said, if I needed to go home, I needed to do something for him or for his friends. Would you consider that force? Yes. So Mr. Cantrell also spent some time talking about trauma. Um, and as it relates to specific things within our body. Does trauma always leave a visible mark or injury? It does not. Um, so given her history and her narrative history and your physical examination and the evidence that you've collected, was all of that consistent with her, her history, her narrative history? Yes, it is. Um, Mr. Cantrell asked you the question about isn't no DNA very strong evidence that my client did not commit this crime? Do you remember that question? I do. And you said no, but he didn't let you explain. <laughs> Why is that not very strong evidence? We often do not find DNA for many reasons. Ones we've talked about, just with time, it goes away with touching doorknobs, with everything that touches that body, then you lose some of that DNA. So, <laughs> Most of the time we do not find DNA. Have you ever dealt with cases where um, a, an assailant or suspect has confessed where on your examination you did not find DNA? To your knowledge? I, I can't answer that one because we don't get any follow-up. We don't know what happens with the suspect. So I, I can't answer that question. But again, no DNA in this case is consistent with your thir over 1300 examinations with the history that she provided. Yes, it is. So I wanna go kind of point by point by the sexual touching so that we, we're on the same page about what she told you happened. As far as um, sexual contact, we talked about uh, penile oral penetration, right? Yes. So she did say that happened. Yes. You also talked about on um, direct examination that there was some sexual touching, but it was over the clothes. Yes. Where did she say that she that he touched her body? Object. You're saying? That would be uh, not relevant. relevant. Not medically relevant. All right, that'll be overruled. You can answer that question. It's taken time because of sorting out the players. May I approach on? Yes. The court? Yes.
right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you a short break uh, till 2.45. Will that give you guys enough time or maybe a little bit more? Should I say 2.50? All right, okay, you gotta say, because sometimes I see the break sign and sometimes I don't. So we're gonna come back in at uh, 2.50. Uh, remember what I said, you've heard some testimony, you're not allowed to discuss it amongst yourself or with anyone else. Just make sure your badges are visible and no investigation. Everything you need, will you'll get from inside the courtroom. Everyone, please rise. Okay. <clears throat> or publish the truth of that. So, we would like to be. We just don't have a job. I mean, at this point, like, we're doing these backdoor, later, after it's already been admitted, redactions, it's already been admitted. Trying to follow the spirit of the judge's ruling earlier. Hmm? Trying to follow the spirit of the judge's ruling earlier on the motion. Consistent. So, you want to wait a second, judge? One, one minute so we can talk to you about this? You don't mind? Is it? All right, just give me one. Yes. Oh, the jury's been published. Yes. So, so the state produced it, but hasn't been published for some information that relates to some of the people other than that. All right, is that is in exhibit number seven? Exhibit number seven. So seven is their exam. So yes. you're just questioning this witness about what's in state exhibit number seven? Yes, it was admitted without a bill. All right, so state's exhibit number seven is in evidence. It's in evidence, but it hasn't been published yet. And so what we would like to do so that the jury's not confused is to um, redact that portion that pertains to that. There were no objections to state's exhibit number seven, and the witness has been testifying to everything from seven. That, that is true. Like I said, it still hasn't been uh, published, but also uh, we gave a ruling that no mention of other people would uh, be allowed in. So they actually violated the rule. Well, no. They offered state's exhibit number seven into evidence, and the defense said that they had no objections to seven. It wasn't a violation of my rule. Each witness was informed, or the state was to inform their witnesses what not to speak of. But so we're just asking that that portion that deals with the people be redacted. Where is he states exhibit number and seven, please? Stuff about my, my State, are you planning on publishing this to the jury with this uh, witness now or no? We do not plan on publishing to the jury. All right, so we'll take um, the matter of the contents of states exhibit number seven that was admitted without objection. Um, outside the presence of the jury, the state has said that they're not going to be uh, publishing it at this point in time and not asking this witness about what other um, alleged co-actors did. Is that correct? Yes, All right, let's bring the jury in. Yes. All right, for the jury. All right, everyone, please be seated. All right, State. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Whitty, where we left off was we were talking about what this defendant has been alleged to do as far as sexual contact. We previously left off about touching, um, you had mentioned during your history, narrative history, that Sarah had said that she was touched over the clothing. Can you tell this jury where she stated that she was touched over her clothing by this defendant? He touched me right here, parentheses, pointing to genital area, end of parentheses, and on my butt on the outside of my clothes. I tried to push him off, but he kept doing it. Okay. So um, in that case, we have her saying that he touched her, her being Sarah, uh, on her genitals. On the outside of her clothing. Yes. Um, also, you noted during your swabs um, some other taking the reason that you took certain pieces or certain swabs. Um, as far as this defendant is concerned, where um, is there any allegation of touching of her breasts by this defendant? 
Yes. Okay. And specifically, do you recall what she said about that? He kissed my breast. To you, does that indicate oral breast touching? Yes. So is it fair to say in summation we have, as far as sexual contact is concerned, penile oral penetration, touching over the clothes of the victim's genitals, and um, oral breast touching? Yes. I'll pass the witness. All right, defense. But ma'am, you didn't find any scientific evidence of that, did you? Of what, sir? Of some type of any kind of scientific evidence <clears throat> to show that my client either touched her breast, uh, kissed her on the lips, um, um, found uh, semen in her mouth or any other part of her body. There's no evidence of that whatsoever, is there? No physical evidence. And obviously you weren't there, but when, when someone ejaculates in someone's mouth, they either spit it out or swallow it, right? I'm not saying you're an expert in that field. <laughs> <laughs> A little pit crawl under the table, <laughs> or it absorbs. Okay, but yeah. as a general rule, somebody will either spit it out, I would think, or swallow it, right? Yes. So if someone spits it out, there's a good chance you would get semen, like either on the body or on the clothes, uh, or just somewhere on on that person or the other person, right? It all depends on where it goes. Sure, but that's a good chance, correct? It all depends on where it, there's no common understood but the, the fact of the matter is my client's dna according to the report you read and with the 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 testing that you did that day uh, when sarah came there on the 30th of march um you did not find any scientific evidence that leaked leaked i'm sorry that uh would uh, lead him to being the perpetrator of uh, doing that act. Isn't that right? I did not find any dried secretions. You didn't find any DNA other, otherwise, right? I mean, none. I, I don't get, I don't see DNA, Understood. but I did not find any dried secretions. Which would, you're hoping to be in those dried secretions DNA, right? Correct. So that was absolutely no evidence of his dried secretions on her body her clothing, her neck, her mouth, her abdomen, uh, her pelvis, um, anywhere. Isn't that right? The lab found no biological evidence. And that's consistent. You didn't either. I did not see any evidence. Thank you very much, Pastor Williams. One brief follow up. Mr. Cantrell spent a lot of time talking about forensic evidence or physical evidence. And he asked you whether the lack of physical evidence um, that, that sh there's no physical evidence to show that he did it, right? Correct. Again, there's no physical evidence to prove that he didn't do it either. Correct. And the lack of physical evidence in this case, was that consistent or inconsistent with the narrative histories? Consistent. I'll pass the witness. No other questions at this time, Your Honor. All right, is this witness excused or subject to recall? As far as we're concerned, she's excused. We'd have to be, she'd be excused. All right, the rule has been invoked. What that means is you can't discuss your testimony with anything, anyone other than attorneys for the state of the defense. Do you understand? I do. All right, thank you. You may step down. And if you'll leave that exhibit with the court reporter, please. All right, state, call your next witness. State calls Viarica Fundriano. Do you solemnly swear affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth will help you, God? All right, you can lower your hand.
And I'm going to need you, um, you can slide the chair up and please keep your voice raised so that the court reporter and so that the jurors can hear. All right. And could you state your name for the record? State your name for the record. Uh, my name is Fiorica Fundurano. Safe. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Fundariano, um, you know Sarah Fundariano? She's my daughter. Okay. Um, where are you from? Romania. So were you born in Romania? Yes. Um, you're here in the United States. So when did you move to the United States? When? Yes. 1996. And when you moved to the United States, um, did you move to San Antonio? No. First, we lived in Sacramento for about 10 years and then we moved here. Okay, do you remember when you moved to San Antonio? Yes, in 2004. Um, what year was Sarah born? 2003. So how old approximately was she when she moved to San Antonio? One year. Um, so all of her school age has Sarah lived here in San Antonio? Yes. Um, I want to direct your attention to March 29th of 2020. Um, do you remember that day? Yes. And I kind of want to start from um, the, the reason that we're here really is that, um, did you see Sarah that day? Yes. And when did you see her? Uh, during the day. Okay. And was she at home all day? Yes. Did she eventually leave the home? Yes. Do you know about what time she left the home? Evening, like after five. Okay. And um, when she left the house, did you know that she was leaving the house? No. Um, did you see her leave the house? Yes. Um, so were you surprised that she was gone later in the day? A little bit, yes. Okay. Um, at that point, did you... Were you aware of her phone situation? Yes. Well, did she have a working phone at that point? She had a phone uh, that had, had no service. So she had to have Wi-Fi in uh, order to be able to use it. And so on March 29th of 2020, you were aware of that? Yes. When she left um, that day, did she tell you where she was going? No. And um, after she left, did you ever try contacting her? um yes once or twice but then i i was waiting for her because i knew she could not answer the phone or she could not use it unless she is in a place where she can use it why were you contacting her um i just wanted to know where she she is okay um eventually do you get a hold of sarah no she called me so she called me first time when i was talking with her was uh, about 11 o'clock in the night. When you talked to her, did she call you from her phone? No. Whose phone did she call you from? Um, she told me that somebody gave the phone to her because her phone, I don't know what happened with her phone, but she she said, mom, please don't, don't hang up, it's me. And she was crying. Okay. And well, that, we're not gonna go into really what she said, when she left earlier in that day, was there anything about her mood or demeanor, her attitude um, that was out of the ordinary? No. When she called you about 11 o'clock at night, how would you describe her attitude or demeanor? Uh, she, was, she was so scared and she cried. Actually, it was a FaceTime. I was surprised she, she was calling me on FaceTime. And then I realized that uh, she really needed to talk with me straight face to face and and i saw her crying she was devastated and she was so scared and uh she said mom mom i i i am i, I want to come home okay um based on how you saw her were you concerned that something might have happened yes right away and when she called you um from that person's phone were you necessarily expecting a call from her um yes i i was thinking that if she, it's late and she she might call so this is why i didn't go to sleep i was 
I was thinking, okay, I hope she will call and let me know what's happening or where she is and when she's coming home because uh, I was a little bit nervous. She didn't say anything when she left. Okay. Um, and without telling me specifically, I don't want to hear what she necessarily said, but did she tell you what happened? No. Um, eventually, does she come back home? Yes. Do you know how she got home? A friend. And do you know what friend brought her home? Brandon. And do you know Brandon? Yes. And how did you know him? Uh, he, he's friend with, with Sarah and uh, he doesn't live far from our home. So I know how he looks. I know I had a few talks with him and uh, I know him. Okay. When she arrived home, um, did you talk to her? Yes, right away. I was waiting for her. Um, had her attitude or demeanor changed? She she was sobbing and, and shaking. I gave her a hug and I, I assured her that I love her. And I tried to find out what happened, but she didn't want to talk. And um, are you aware of, were police eventually called? Yes. And do you know who called police? Uh, her sister. Okay. Um, so after police came, did they come to the house? Yes, the police came. Okay. And did Sarah talk to the police officer? Yes. Um, by that point, had her attitude or demeanor changed? She was still scared. She was still scared, but... Um, she 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 was trying to make me understand that she cannot talk to me so i was staying away and let them talk so prior to her calling you at about 11 p.m from that stranger's phone um were you aware of anything that happened um in between the time she left the house and then she called you no no so had anybody else called you to tell you what had happened no Um, do you remember if Sarah went for a type of a medical exam? Yes, she went. I, you, I, as I remember, I think next day. Yeah, right next day. And do you know who took her? Her sister. Um, eventually, after this, did you speak to um, a detective involved in the case? Excuse me? Did you speak after she yes, had gone to the hospital? Yes. How did that detective contact you? Um, so he, right away after he talked to her, he talked to me. I was waiting outside of the house. Okay. Um, because they were in the family room and I didn't want her to, to be disturbed by me listening to what she was saying. So I was stepping outside and another officer was there on the porch and I was talking with him a little bit. And then the one that was inside came outside and we talk. Did a detective ever call you on the phone? Yes. And do you know when that happened? Uh, after a while, I, yeah, I realized. And he told me, I think, I think he told me right then, uh, after he came outside, that some he was uh, abused or somehow sustained. So prior to Sarah leaving the house that day, did you see her getting ready or anything like that? No. Okay. Mm -mm. Um, did it seem like anything special that she was leaving for? No, no. Um, after, after the police came, but before you, um, she went to the um, hospital for a medical exam, did Sarah stay in the house that night? Yes. I'll pass the witness. Defense. Ms. Wondrian, thank you for being here today. I needed to ask you a couple of questions. One of the things that you uh, said in answer to Mr. Villarreal's questions is that a few days after the incident that you talked on the phone with the detective. Is that right? Do you remember talking on the phone with the detective? Yes. Okay. And I think that they talked to your daughter first and then she handed the phone to you because she had to do a school project. Does that sound right? I don't remember. Okay. But you remember at some point, a few days later, four or five days later, 
you talked to a detective. Does that sound right? I remember I talked on the phone, but I don't know exactly when and how many days after. Do you recall if that was San Antonio Police Department Detective Benavidez? Do you remember his name? I remember his name. Was it Benavidez? Yes. Okay. Okay. Do you recall telling Detective Benavidez that Sarah left your house at about 8 p.m. that night? Do you recall telling him that when he called you on the phone? No. You don't recall telling him what time she left? No. Okay. Do you recall telling them that before she left that she changed and put on makeup? Do you recall telling the detective that? Uh, no. You don't she recall was... telling the detective that? No. Okay. Do you recall her telling you that she was going out skateboarding with her friends? No, she didn't say what she's going to do or where she's going to. So you don't remember what she no. told you she was Mm-mm. going to do? No. Okay. Sarah has had a history of lying to you, hasn't she? Judge, I'm no. going to object. Can we approach? Yes. Withdrawn. Oh. I believe this was subject to our motion in limine. Okay. And, all right. And the defense has withdrawn the question. Do you? I'll withdraw. I'll go a different direction. Thank you. Do you know whether... Sarah enjoyed skateboarding in your neighborhood? Uh, She did a few times, but then she stopped because she had a very bad falling and she stopped. But for a while, she enjoyed skateboarding in your neighborhood, right? Uh, Usually right close to our house. Do you recall if she had been skateboarding earlier that day? No. Before she went out again, no, you don't recall? Okay. okay. Would it be strange to you if she said she wanted to go out skateboarding? Would that would that have surprised you around that time if she said she wanted to go skateboarding? I don't know. Okay. I don't I can't say anything about that. About two years ago. Do you know what kind of music she liked? Was she always listening to music? Like all kinds of music, like teenager they listen to. Okay. You don't remember one specific kind? No. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. State? I have no further questions, Judge. Is this witness excused or subject for recall? We ask that she be excused. She's excused, Your Honor. All right, thank you. The rule has been invoked. What that means is you can't discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state and the, or the defense. Do you understand? Can you say it louder, please? All right. I'm sorry. That's okay. The rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state and attorneys for the defense. Do you understand? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. State, call your next witness. The state calls Rebecca Garcia. That's the equipment in the morning. So. Right. It was all right, please have a seat, please. Can you raise your right hand for me? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God? Yes, I do. All right, just make sure you speak up so attorneys, so that the jurors can hear you and so that the court reporter can hear you, okay? If you could state your name for the record. My name is Rebecca Garcia. State. Good afternoon, Rebecca. Thank you for being here. Um, can you tell us how you're related to Sarah? I'm her older sister. Okay, and what's your age different? 12 years. Okay, so you're really her older sister. Yeah, 31 next week, so. Um, And so you've known her her whole life? Yes, I've known her my whole life. Okay, and you have you always lived in the same home as her? Um, Yes, up until I got married at 20 and I moved out then. Um, How would you describe your relationship with your sister? Uh, My relationship is really good. Um, The good thing is that even when I moved out, I was always still in San Antonio, so I always uh, stayed really close with my sister. You know, the age difference is really big, so always was a challenge to connect with her depending on, like, you know, the time of life she's in, but we have a pretty good relationship. Keep in touch. I mean, probably every single week. Um, I see her at least once or twice. And do you currently live in San Antonio? I do. And what do you do? I'm a dentist. Um, Okay. And when this happened, this offense back in March of 2020, 
um, you were out of the home that your sister lived in? Yes. Okay. So she was living with your mom? Yes. She's living with my parents. Okay. Um, do you remember getting a call from Sarah on that date? Yes, I do. I do. Okay. And when you got that call, um, were you expecting it? No, not at all. No, it was late at night. Didn't recognize the number. So I'm surprised I even picked up, honestly. Okay. Um, and without telling us what Sarah said, um, can you describe what her, um, her voice sounded like on the call? Sure. Um, it was just really shaky. She was sobbing. She just sounded really scared. Um, you know, I've heard my sister cry before, but not like that. Okay. Um, so this was, have you had heard her cry like that since? I've heard her cry like, um, you know, in relation to that situation, but it's very few and far between. It's just like those moments in the last couple of years where she has opened up to me a little bit about it, but I think it's really hard for her to talk about. Okay. Um, what did you do after you got that phone call from your sister? Well, after she went over some of what happened, um, I just, you know, suggested that we call the police and I asked her if she wanted to call or if she wanted me to call for her and, and she suggested I call. And where were you when you received that call? I was in my house. Okay. And did you stay there? I did. I did. Okay. And so it was during the pandemic. So I, I feel like that was like a time where it was like, everything was masked up. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember going there. Okay. Um, so you asked her if she wanted to call 911. Yes. Well, I suggested she call and then she was kind of scared to call. So I called for her, but okay. yeah. And did you make that call from your home? Yeah. From my cell phone. Okay. And was Sarah on that call? No, okay. no. Just it was me. just a phone call that you made to law Same. enforcement. Okay. Um, did you direct law enforcement to any particular address? I gave them my parents' address. Okay. And do you know if they went there? They did. They did. Okay. And you didn't go to the home? No, not uh, that, not that night. When did you go to the home? Um, in the morning to pick her up for the testing at the hospital. Okay. Um, can you describe her demeanor when you saw her that morning? She was completely like not there, uh, very withdrawn, very flat. Um, you know, I told her like, she doesn't need to say anything. Obviously she was traumatized, but I said, if, if you need to discuss anything, like I'm, I'm happy to listen. So it was a pretty quiet ride to the hospital. Okay. Um, and is that normal for her? No, no. When you, um, got to the hospital, what did you do? Well, um, we went in, I think it, I don't know the name of the hospital. It's the one off Floyd Curl in the medical center. I think that's it is. Um, we went in and, and we told them why we were there. Cause the cops had given my parents the direction. I had the paper and, um, they said I couldn't go back with her cause of the pandemic. So I just went back to my car while they took her back. Okay. And then did you drive her home after the exam? That's what I remember. Okay. Do you remember what type of phone Sarah was using around that time period? It was, I think it was just an iPhone with no service at the time. Yeah. It like, she would honestly like the years get by me, but I think it was, you know, she called me when she had Wi-Fi, but like not, you know, from a phone number. Okay. And did she usually only have a phone that was Wi-Fi use only? I mean, there was a time where she had her phone connected. I don't know at that time, whether it had been disconnected by my parents or if, you know, if it had just not been a time where she had her cell phone yet, because she was 16 at the time. So I don't remember. Okay. That's okay. Um, did you ever give any statements to a detective? I, I called the number back, um, or the, the number my mom gave me to call for the detective. And then when I, you know, had given him the call, he said, well, at this point, the case already made it to the DA and we don't need a statement from you. Okay. Um, but you did follow up with him in case you needed to. Yes. I pass witness. Defense. No questions. All right. Is this witness excused or subject for recall? Excused by the state, Your Honor. Excused by defense. 
All right, the rule has been invoked. What that means is you can't discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state or the defense. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. You're excused. Thank you. State, call your next witness. State Health Detective Ivan Benavides. Good afternoon. My name is Ivan Benavides. All right, State. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Detective Benavides, how are you employed? I'm uh, with the San Antonio Police Department. I'm a uh, detective. So, prior to becoming a detective with SAPD, um, were you a patrol officer with SAPD? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And how how do you become a San Antonio Police Department officer? Um, basically, you have to go through uh, several steps. Um, some of them are background checks, um, uh, testing. You have to take a test. Um, also, uh, oral board, and uh, and of course, the uh, police academy. Um, what is the police academy, generally speaking? Um, it includes, uh, of course, physical training, uh, classes on um, Texas law, uh, federal law, um, um, traffic, traffic laws, um, um, CCP, Code of Criminal Procedures, um, on um, um, officer safety, so. Okay. Um, when did you join SAP? That was on March of 2001. And prior to 2001, did you have any other law enforcement experience? I worked about a year, year and a half at the magistrate's office and detention center. Um, what steps does it take to become, move from a, or promote from a, an officer to a detective? Um, so you have to go, uh, you have to take a test, an exam, a written exam. Um, and of course, the uh, the top um, 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 so many, depending on the slots that are available, uh, they choose so many from from that list. Okay. Yes. When did you promote to detective? That was in September of 2018. And when you promoted to detective, did you get an assignment into a certain section or division? Yes, sir. Um, I was assigned to the special victims unit. And so that was again in 2018. 2018, yes, sir. And how long did you stay in uh, the Special Victims Unit? Approx approximately two and a half years. So uh, on March 29th of 2020, were you, were you assigned to the Special Victims Unit? Yes, I was, sir. Uh, currently, as of today, uh, what is your rank? I'm a detective. And are you still with SVU? No, I am not. Uh, where are you currently assigned? I'm currently assigned to the West Property Crimes uh, Unit. And when did you move to <clears throat> Property Crimes? I believe that was in February of 2021. So what is, and I wanna relate this in particular to a SVU or Special Victims Unit Detective, what is your role and function um, within the unit? Uh, basically, um, you get cases assigned um, and you are to investigate those cases. And what I mean, what I mean by investigating cases, uh, conduct interviews, uh, submit uh, evidence to the lab, um, and when, you, when I'm talking about interviews, I'm talking complainants, victims, suspects, uh, witnesses. In on March 29th of 2020, or, or around there, were you assigned a case involving a defendant by the name of Alexis Morganfield? Yes, sir. Um, with a complainant of Sarah Fundriani? Yes, sir. Um, do you remember? Uh, were you able to determine Sarah's date of birth? I'm sorry, sir. Were you able to determine Sarah's Fundariana's date of birth? Yes, sir. Um, do you remember that date of birth? I don't remember the exact date of birth. Would having a copy of your report help refresh your memory? Yes, yes, sir. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Detective Benavides, I'm going to show you what I am marking as state exhibit number eight for identification purposes. All right, sir. Do you recognize that document? I do, sir. And what do you recognize it to be? That is the charge and disposition report along with the uh, prosecution guide. Okay, if you can just thumb through it real quick sure. and just make sure that it hasn't been changed, altered in any way.
No, sir. The only thing that I can tell is the um, there's a small underlying. Um, there's a small marking under a nickname here of okay. the defendants. That's about it. Okay. Other than that, besides that one underline, is it um, essentially the same report that you submitted to the DA's office? That is correct, sir. Um, so if you need to refresh your memory from the court, please do so. Just please don't read directly um, from it out loud, okay? Yes, sir. So if you can look at the report and tell me what was Sarah Bundariano's date of birth. Her date of birth was is July 28th, 2003. And um, we'll talk about it more extensively in a minute, but um, were you able to identify uh, the defendant, Alexis Morganfield? Yes, sir. And were you able to determine a date of birth for him? Yes, sir. What is his date of birth? His date of birth is May 21st, 2000. So is it fair to say that he's about three months and two, three years and two months older than um, Sarah Fundrian? Yes, sir. So how does a case get assigned to you? So after the responding officer makes the scene and um, generates the report, it is forwarded over to the special victims unit. Uh, one of the supervisors will um, review the report and he will uh, assign it to whichever investigators available. Um, and so in this case, uh, and I should back it up for a second. When you get assigned a case, and I'm thinking in very general terms, what do you get when you get assigned a case? Like what information is provided to you? Most of the time you just get the report, a copy of the report. And is that the re offense report from the initial responding officer? Correct, yes. And so what is your responsibility at that point once after you get that report? Of course, review the report, um, make sure that you have uh, contact information for victims, witnesses, suspects, and see if there's any evidence available in the uh, property room. So on this case, do you remember or do you recall if that was basically what your starting point was, was just the report? Yes, sir. Based on the report, um, what did you what did you do next? I started off by um, attempting to contact the victim okay. and her mother. Eventually, were you able to speak with both of them? Yes, sir. And how did you um, speak with them? Via a telephone call. Now, this is March of 2020. Yes, sir. Was that something typical of how you would conduct interviews? No, sir. Why not? Because of the uh, COVID had just, um, I guess had been, um, had just started. So there were a lot of things we were unsure about. So uh, that was the best, um, I guess at that time was just to do everything over the phone. So although it was not the normal, typical practice of SVU, this is how you were, this is how the police department responded and for safety reasons. Correct. Sir. So you speak to, eventually you speak to Sarah, and um, Viorica, I believe is her name, Funariano. Yes, sir. Um, when you talk to Sarah, without telling me specifically what she said, was her statement to you consistent with the report and the statement that she gave to the responding officer that night? Yes, sir. So after you talk to her, as it relates to Alexis Morganfield, um, did you have any identifying information? The information that I recall having is um, social media information. Okay. So who provided that information to you? The victim. And do you recall if there was like a specific name or username that she provided to you? Yes, sir. And did you use that information to further identify the defendant? Yes, sir. What social media platforms did you look at? Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. So using those, um, were you able to identify accounts that related to Alexis Morganfield? Yes, sir. And um, is that the Instagram profile of Alexis Morganfield? Yes, sir. Um, and is there a particular name that's associated with it? Lil, Lil Kowali. Okay. And just for the jury so that they can what is it? How is it spelled? It's L-I-L-K-W-O-L-L-Y underscore. 
using that name, were you able to identify other social media platforms? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as state's exhibit number nine and 10 for identification purposes. Do you recognize those? Yes, sir, I do. And did you um, capture these images or take them from the internet? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. And what in these photos directly relates to the identification of Alexis Morgan Field? Of course, the uh, the username and the photo itself. And so what platform do states exhibits numbers nine and 10 relate to? This one is Twitter and both of them are Twitter. Yes, sir. I'm gonna show you what's been marked as states exhibits numbers 11 and 12. Okay. Um, and looking at those, what social media platform do those relate to? YouTube. And again, do we see that same name of Will K. Wally? Yes, sir. And during this process of going through all these social media accounts, did you become familiar with how Alexis Morganfield looked? Yes, sir. And are the photos contained in state's exhibits numbers 11 and 12, 9 and 10, consistent with the images of Alexis Morgan Field and what's already been admitted in state's exhibits one, two, three, and four. Yes, sir. So is it fair to say state's exhibits one through four and nine through twelve all relate to the same Alexis Morgan fields? That's correct, sir. And again, state's exhibits numbers nine. And eleven and twelve were these images that you yourself went on the on the, on the internet and took screenshots of. That's correct, yes, sir. And did you use state exhibits numbers nine, ten, eleven, and twelve to identify in part Alexis Morgan? Yes, sir. Now, at this time, state would move to admit state exhibits numbers nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Entering two different projections of any as previously provided in electronic discovery. Your Honor, with regard to States Exhibit 10, 11, and 12, we have no objection. <clears throat> we believe that States Exhibit 9 is not my clients, and we're prepared to make, a, make an argument to the court to that effect. But we do not object to 10, 11, and 12. All right, States Exhibit number 10, 11, and 12 are admitted without objection. And I can see States Exhibit number 9, please. Would you like to see all of them? Uh, just number 9. All right, you can be seated. All right, defense, you want to take the witness on board here as it relates to exhibit number nine? Detectives? Yes, sir. Uh, get your attention towards uh, state's exhibit nine. Here. Yes, sir. And I believe you stated after um, you had conversations with Sarah, you started on your own to look up um, a little, little koala. That's correct, sir. And one of the profiles you stated. Uh, was this one, state's exhibit number nine? That is correct, uh, the photo right there in the okay. circle. So are, are you testifying is that there's just a picture of him on there? You're not saying he created this profile. May, may I take a look at it one more sure. time, sir? Thank you. That's correct, that's the photo of him. So um, with what you're saying though then is that the rest of this that's on this photograph, you don't know who created it whatsoever. You can't you can't tell the judge or this jury that uh, Lil Kawali created this profile, correct? That is correct, sir. So, uh, based on that, Your Honor, we'd ask that State's Exhibit Nine be excluded. All right, State. Any questions? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's show you State's sure. Exhibit Number Nine, Number Ten. Yes, sir. Has been admitted to you without objection. Yes, sir. And number nine is the one that's a question. Sure. Can you tell me if that picture in state exhibit number nine is just a smaller picture of what's already in state exhibit number 10? That is correct, sir. State exhibit number 10, is this, was this photo that you got a, um, a picture that is sourced from the same Twitter account that's in state exhibit number nine? Yes, sir. It was enlarged. Yes, sir. And I understand that you cannot tell me who created this account, correct? That is correct. And as a matter, you did not use necessarily um, who created this account in order for the identification. That is correct. So as you 
relied on seats exhibits numbers 9, 10, 11, and 12, uh, were all of those pictures used to gather information that is connected to one each other, one and each other to identify Alexis Morgan Field. That is correct, yes, sir. So basically, detectives, you're saying that I looked up uh, Lil Kuali um, and you found these items on the internet. Yes, sir. You have no clue as to who put those on the in internet. No, sir. And all you're, I guess, going to be able to testify is that um, I don't know who created this uh, this page, but I found pictures of my client of my client um, on on those uh, pages. I found, okay. yes, sir. I found pictures with the uh, same um, username. Mat the username matching those photos. Understood. And since you can't testify as to who put those there or who created that, um, is that a um, sample of? Have, have you ever heard of the word uh, bots, fake fake accounts, and things like that? Not that particular word, but I. There are fake accounts all over social media. Yes, sir. So, you can't tell this jury that that is something accurate that my client created, because if you looked at this defendant's exhibit number nine, um, do you still have it in front of you? Yes, sir. And uh, it says zero followers, right? Zero following, I guess. Zero following. That, that would um, lead you to believe that someone's never seen that or, or has ever responded to that account, right? No, sir. They're never That has never been seen or responded? Uh, when someone's following an account, they have followers, right? They yes, sir. respond to an account. Are you with me? I I'm sorry. I'm, not, I'm sorry, but I I'm not uh, not necessarily. If you follow someone, you don't have to respond. You can just follow someone. Understood. So as, as a general rule, though, either that account is uh, a brand new account or no one's ever followed it. Would that be fair? And, and can you rephrase the it? Box. And click the box I'm following that account. In other words, you got to click I'll follow somebody, right? Like if you want to follow Elon Musk or um, or the judge um, here in this court, if you want to follow her tweets or whatever, you can say I'm following it. That's right? correct. Yes, sir. All right. So on that one, it's no followers, right? Zero followers. Okay. I'm sorry. Zero following. Following. Yes. So it's on the internet. It has no no followers or following, um, you can't tell this jury that my client created that and posted those pictures, right? That is correct. Um, a lot of other different people could have done that. It's possible, yes, sir. And, and you've heard of that all the time. And that happens, people create fake accounts of other people, um, either for sh scamming purposes or, or what other, whatever uh, other purposes that you can just imagine, right? Yes, it does happen, yes, sir. So you can't testify to the jury that Alex would be responsible for whatever's on those accounts or otherwise if he didn't create that. Okay, one more time. What was that? Can you repeat the question, you please? Testify to the jury that uh, Alex here uh, would be responsible for the content of those um, different accounts if he did not create create that. No, I would not be able to testify to that, no, sir. Pass away. Um, as it relates to state's exhibit number nine, um, if you could look at the bottom where it has a post, uh, November 28th, 2017, out now, SoundCloud, I'm only 13. Do you see a name um, that you associated later with this case to help identify Alexis Morganfield? Yes, sir. What name is that? Uh, Jay DeKing. Okay. And since we're outside the presence of the jury, um, were you able to identify uh, through your investigation, who this Jada King, King is? Yes, sir. And who is that? I look through my report real quick. That will be Jalen Cornell Green. And were you able to find um, other ways that they were um, associated? 
Yes, sir. And in what ways? Found a uh, case number SAPD 1923-3542 in which Mr. Uh, the defendant and Mr. Green were both associated with. They were both listed on that report. That's correct, yes, sir. And they're listed to be associated within that report. Yes, sir. Um, and did you use that information in helping to identify Alexis Morganfield? Yes, sir. Um, and that Jaden Green is also the same person that you come to find out is the person also associated with the username of J-G-A-K-I-N-G. Yes, sir. I'll pass away this. Your Honor, um, this is beyond the scope of the motion in limine. Um, however, um, we're not going to we're not going to object to the fact that um, Jada King was the person Sarah went to go meet. We will not object to that because that's State's Exhibit Number Nine. Uh, the defense's objection is sustained. Is there anything else? Uh, no, Your Honor. Judge, right. just since we're outside the presence of the jury, yes. so we don't have to excuse them again. Yes. Um, we anticipate and subject to the court's ruling saying that eliciting through this witness that he used this information obviously we're not going to say that they were suspects in a case but he was able to identify that name those user names um to these people um in a different report and i would i know that this is touching on the um defense's motion in limine and so i wanted to have this opportunity to uh, he, get a ruling from the court as far as the admissibility of that information all right but hasn't he already identified the defendant through these photos is there a need for um type uh, um walking well, towards the line of the motion in limine the concern i have judge is that i would not have a problem with that if they're not going to argue it, right mm -hmm. but if i can't anticipate what they are going to argue and so i think and uh the court this, is this adds to the identification level and so if they're going to stand up and say that we did not properly authenticate or properly identify Mr. Morganfield, then this information is completely relevant to that information. Well, um, two things. Sarah already testified that uh, Mr. Morganfield was the person that um, was in that car with her. Uh, secondly, she already testified that she was going to go meet Jada King. So that's all in evidence already. So there's I mean the defense is not going to argue that she didn't testify to meeting Jada King. No, quite contrary. Okay. All right. Um, state, you're not allowed to go into any acts that were alleged to have been committed by anyone other than Mr. Morganville. I understand that then, Judge. And so we we're going to move and eliminate this point that they prevent they're prevented from arguing that we have not sufficiently identify him and I ask that the court allow me if that is argued to reopen our case at that point we we will concede now that uh he has been identified more than one time okay. Okay, cool. all right let's bring the jury back in so just for the no, record no. judge so I have to keep my notes clear not 10 through 12 are admitted and you're going to uh sustain the objection on a nine yes okay. and 10 for the record 10 11 and 12 were admitted without objection we have nine. Uh, no mm -hmm. so what was that ruling judge I didn't hear it uh 10 11 and 12 were admitted without objection uh nine was sustained and say is this your last witness or you it's not how many more do you have? Okay. It'll be last one company's Okay. Fix the air conditioner. No, you have to talk to, to um the powers that be, whoever's overcharged in charge of um the AC in the 187th and the broken equipment. I have a really good AC guy. All right. Do you just pass that information along? All right, we're ready. All right, the jury. So again, Detective Benavides, um, as it relates to state's exhibits numbers nine through 12, you use that information in identifying um, Alexis Morganfield. Yes, sir. Do you see Mr. Morganfield in the courtroom today? I do, sir. And can you point at him and identify him by piece of clothing? Uh, gentleman sitting at the corner, uh, black suit, with a red tie. Connor, may the record reflect this witness has identified the defendant. After you identified Mr. Morganfield, were you able to identify some of the locations that the victim told you about in her statement? Yes, sir. And 
as it relates to um, a gas station that was mentioned. Were you able to identify uh, a location for that? Yes, sir. Gas station? Yes, sir. And what address did you come to find out that was? 7050 IH 35 North. And is that located here in Bear County, Texas? Yes, sir. Um, additionally, through uh, a matter of course of your investigation and speaking with um, witnesses on this case, were you able to identify um, the apartment complex in which this assault, or I'm sorry, in which this uh, case is alleged to have been committed? Yes, sir. And what is that location? 3644 Zingleman Road. And is that also located here in Bear County, Texas? Yes, it is. So after you've identified Mr. Morgan Fields um, and you've talked with all, um, you talked with the um, victim as well as her mother, um, did you contact any other um, witnesses as it relates to the um, gas station? I did not, sir. Okay. Was that information followed up on? Yes, sir. By who? Detective Escareno. And when, um, in talking with Detective Escareno and in the matter of your investigation, were you able to recover any um, surveillance videos? No, sir. Why not? It had expired. The video had expired already. Um, so that that information or that that evidence was not available at the time that you tried to get it. That's correct. And um, did you, when you talked to the victim, did she provide any other names of um, witnesses, not suspects um, or suspect in this case? Did she mention a Brandon? That's correct, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And did you attempt to talk to Brandon? Yes, I did. Were you successful in talking to Brandon? No, sir. Um, did you attempt to talk to the victim's uh, sister? I attempted, but uh, I was not able to talk to her. So after you, this is to say the last step that you took in this case was um, attempting to contact the victim's sister. Yes, sir. And at that time, were the um, lab results available um, for the items that was sent to the lab? Yes, sir. There were um, items submitted on two different times. Okay. And is it fair to say that no biological evidence was found? Yes, sir. And then after talking to her, getting the BC, the Bear County Crime Lab information and analysis, um, at that point, did you submit the case to the Bear County District Attorney's Office? Yes, sir, I did. And uh, for what offense? It would be for uh, sexual assault of a child. Did as it relates to the gas station, were you um, were you able to identify uh, any witnesses at the gas station? I was not, sir. Did you attempt to, or did somebody attempt to? Detective Escarano, yes, sir. But he was unsuccessful. Yes, sir. I'll pass the witness. Detective, thank you very much for coming here. I represent Mr. Morganfield. Um, when you did your investigation, you also compared your notes with uh, Officer Sandoval? I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by compare my notes. Well, he had made a report. I'm sorry. Uh, you had not done an investigation. I, I'm, I apologize for that. Um, you were the second officer or detective to talk to Sarah, right? Yes, sir. And Officer, officer Sandoval um, was, I guess, the, the first person to make contact with Sarah. I believe so. Yes, sir. That's correct. And did you look at his uh, his report? I did, sir. Uh, did you look at his body cam or anything like that? I did not look at his body cam, just his report, sir. Okay. Um, I'm going to go a little bit out of order, but with respect to uh, Sarah, um, isn't it true that uh, Sarah had told you that, um, Judge Crawford here, sir. Okay. Um, sustain. 
did you learn that uh where did you learn that sarah was was heading to um on march 29th of 2020 i'm sorry calls for hearsay that'll be sustained okay um was sarah going to meet somebody that on march 29th 2020 that is the basis of this investigation I'm sorry, sir. Are you talking about the uh, the interview that I had with her, the phone interview where she mentioned where she was headed? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. And most of the questions I'm going to ask you about that is going to be that um, about that interview um, because um, your report is not as thorough. Would you agree? I'm not too sure what you mean, as thorough. It, well, it was a synopsis. That is correct. Okay. So, um, when you talk to Sarah, uh, Jade, Jada King, you recall that name? I do, sir. And she mentioned that to you, didn't she? Yes, she did. Was that who she was going to see? Yes, sir. And did she ever talk to you about being in an alternative school? Judge, I'm going to object to hearsay, and this is the state's motion in limine. All right, the objection to hearsay will be sustained. Did you ever learn how she uh, knew the, the name Jada King? It was through social media, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And, um, did you learn whether or not she was going to meet up with Jada King on March 29th, 2020? Judge calls for hearsay. That'll be overall. You can answer. Can you repeat the question, sir? Yes. Did you ever learn that she was going to meet up with Jada King uh, on March 29th, 2020, as, as the beginning of this investigation? Yes, sir. I did. Um, did you learn whether she knew things about Jada King, such as? Um, how he might treat women. Judge, can we have sustained? May we approach? No, that objection sustained. Well, I was going to tell you where I was going to go because I think it's relevant. All right, that'll be sustained. Okay. All right. Did you look did you do you have any knowledge of um why she was going to meet Jada King? From what I recall, that we're going to hang out. Did you know anything else? As far as Jada King, it was to hang out, sir. That's what I do recall. That's what, from what I recall. Did you ever learn that uh, the purpose for her to go there was to smoke weed with him? That was not the from what i recall that was not the purpose she didn't come out and say that was the purpose did you ever learn from your investigation that she actually did meet up with jd king yes sir and what did you learn judge i'm going to object this whole line of questioning is just hearsay about the victim statement all right um detective is it if it's something that you've learned through your investigation not from what someone told you but through your investigation you can answer the question if it's based upon what something has told you then the objection to hearsay will be sustained okay um this is what she told me these are things i learned them through uh her statement over the phone okay so so without telling us what you what she told you tell me what you learned from your investigation from that evidence I'm going to object to hearsay. He just responded. This is what the victim told him. All right. A detective, if you've done some investigation based upon what was told to you, you can speak about what you learned um, from what was told to you, but you cannot um, testify to what someone said. Do you understand? I understand, Judge. Um, okay. Can you repeat the question, sir? Absolutely. Um, In your own words, without repeating what someone said, but through your own investigation, um, 
Did she ever sit down and talk to Jada King? Okay. That can be a yes or no. Well, sir, I learned this from her statement, sir. All, all these things that these uh, questions that you're asking me, I learned these things through her statement over the phone, sir. So the um, state's objection will be sustained. So I I'm really trying to understand your questioning, but um, I, I, these things were told to me over the phone, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And I understand that um, most police officer reports can contain what we call hearsay. We you learn it from some someone else, okay, and you write these things down. Correct. And so um, I'm not asking you what she told you, but if okay. you, part of your investigation is also uh, analyzing um, and um, writing down things that someone has, has told you, and that's how it comes into your report. That's correct, yes sir. If I ask you, what did she say? That would be hearsay. Mm -hmm. If you're doing an investigation and you write in your own words, what you believe happened in this case, then that is not hearsay. Uh, no, excuse me. What is hearsay is what the court says it is. I'm sorry. So if you all have any questions, uh, please ask the question. And if there are any objections, make your objections and I'll make my ruling. Okay. So um, did you did you learn from your investigation that um, Sarah met with Jada King? Yes, sir. And did he um, at some point um, ask her to leave or stay if may you recall I, I, i'm trying to recall certainly refresh yep. your memory may, may i take a look at the report real quick let me see here all right sir and i just want to make sure you're asking if jada king asked the victim to leave to leave or um to come on in go into my apartment or did did she uh ask the victim to leave alleged victim Through my investigation, I learned that they met inside the um, one of the vehicles. Okay, yes, and and at that point, uh, did you learn that he had asked her to have perform sex or oral sex with him? Yes, sir. And she refused to do that. Is that right? That is correct. Yes, sir. And um, did she tell you that she knew that Jada King had a uh, was wearing a electronic monitor? Judge, I'm going to object for hearsay. That'll be sustained. Did you ever learn that at this time, did you do an investigation and find out that J.D. King was wearing an electronic monitor? Yes, sir. Did you know whether or not Sarah knew about that electronic monitor? I don't recall if she knew about it or not, sir. Okay. Uh, she could have, you just don't remember? Um, now that I recall, yes, she was aware from what I understand through um, uh, some messaging, I, I believe. Yes, sir. Um, were you also aware through that messaging that uh, um, Sarah knew the reputation of Jada King Judge. with respect to um, women who go visit him judge i'm going to object to hearsay and relevance all right that would be sustained in your invest in your investigation did you learn that sarah knew that jd king um if women um would not have sex with them he would just like throw them out of the car or something to that effect did you learn that that's sustained when sarah arrived to the apartment isn't it true that she never asked jd king to borrow a phone Point you object to hearsay, Judge. Sustained. From your own observations, wasn't there multiple times that Sarah um, had the opportunity to leave uh, the situation that she was in? In other words, she could have left J.D. King and she could have left when um, uh, she was alone in a car. Isn't that true? I'm going to object to foundation and personal knowledge. He was, there's no evidence that he was present during any of this. Sustained. 
Did you not learn that through your investigation? I'm sorry, you, you sustained the, the, the question, ma'am. Did you want me to yes. answer? Not this question. Oh. Through your own investigation, didn't you learn that uh, there were multiple times um, that Sarah could have uh, left the situation that she found herself in? Judge, I'm going to object to hearsay and calls for speculation. All right, that'll be sustained. From your investigation, did you learn that... Um, Sarah claim that um, my client never physically forced her to have uh, perform oral sex on him. Did you learn that? Judge, it calls for hearsay. All right, that objection will be overruled. Okay, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time, sir? Please. Didn't she tell you that my client did not physically force her to perform oral sex on him? Judge, that question clearly calls for hearsay. That'll be overruled. That is correct, sir. And then once she performed oral sex on him, allegedly my client left the car. Yes, sir, that is correct. Isn't it true at some point after that, she had the opportunity to call Brandon to come pick her up. And Brandon was actually called, but could not find where she was called, where, where she was at. You recall that? I do recall. Yes, sir. That was the first time she called Brandon, right? Not the last time. I believe so. Yes, sir. Do you recall in your investigation uh, after Brandon was called? Um, she was going to be um she wanted to wait there for brandon and so um whoever she was talking about uh talking to said that we're leaving or i'm leaving um but you're gonna have to you know wait we're not waiting around for brandon do you recall that guys i'm gonna object to again hearsay sustained <laughs> do you ever recall um uh sarah saying well I'm going to walk to the gate and wait for Brandon. Do you ever re recall that conversation? Sustained. Did you ever determine in your investigation who uh, the driver of, of this Dodge Charger was? Just one second, sir. I think it uh, might be on here. I'll, I'll answer it for you. It was Sarah who told you that, right? That's correct. Yes, sir. I'm, from what I recall, yes, sir. Okay. Did you ever run any kind of uh, auto ownership, whether or not my client owned a Dodge Charger, gray Dodge Charger? I do not, sir. Did you ever learn or uh, try to confirm whether or not uh, Alex loaned Sarah a telephone so that she could call Brandon or text Brandon? No, sir. Isn't it true, officer, that you really had doubts with some of the some of the statements that were made by Sarah to you? I'm going to object to the relevance and invades the province of the jury. It's the same. When you found out that there was no DNA uh, linking Mr. Morganfield, this person, to that to your investigation, that surprised you, didn't it? It did not surprise me, sir. We have cases where there are, there is uh, evidence and sometimes they're just not evidence, sir. Okay. Especially since she didn't go to the following day to, to get the same kit done. Did you tell her to go that night? She was uh, advised by the, from what I recall, by the responding officer. Okay, so she was told it's a good idea to go there because you preserve things, right? Yes, sir. You said you did an investigation um, afterwards of uh, Lil, Lil Wally? Yes, sir. Um, and that purports to be my client, Mr. Morgan Field here, right, Alex? Yes, sir. Um, when you did that, was it a cursory search of the internet after the fact? Yes, sir. And are you familiar with um, bots and uh, people who set up fake accounts using people's um, other internet or their internet names and, and things things of that um, to do harm on other people? Yes, sir. They do it for either monetary purposes or they do it for um, trying to ruin a reputation? That's correct, yes, sir. And 
is it also true, officer or detective? I'm sorry. In your uh, line of work, um, you have either heard of or have investigated um, people who have maliciously trying to harm other people um, using the internet. I'm going to object to relevance. How's this relevant? It's relevant because he's already testified that he's looked, looked at some of these things. Right, you want to approach? Sure. I'm going to withdraw that question. Oh, right there. Um, so. Did you learn um, that Jay DeKing, um, I'm sorry, that Sarah was introduced to Jay DeKing by another individual? Yes, sir. And was that other individual related to Jay DeKing? Yes, sir. You know how they were related? I believe that was his brother. And did you learn that um, that brother? Um, without saying exactly uh, what she learned word for word, but through your investigation, um, what kind of reputation Jay DeKing had um, that Sarah had learned? Judge, I'm going to object to relevance. Sustained. When Sarah went to meet Jay DeKing on March 29th, 2020, do you think that she had a good idea of the reputation of Jay DeKing? Judge, I'm going to sustain. When you spoke to Sarah's mother uh, after your uh, conversation with Sarah, yes, sir. Um, did you? Where did? Uh, where was Sarah heading um, that evening um, that the mother uh, had informed you and you learned in your investigation? Judge, I'm going to object. Calls for hearsay. Sustained. It's in your report. You should have. Uh, Just have personal knowledge is sustained. That. Did you learn that she put makeup on that night? Again, Judge, I'm going to object to calls for hearsay. Sustained. Have you ever heard of anyone putting makeup on before they go skateboarding ever? No, sir. Uh, I. Don't believe I've ever investigated any cases involving someone to go skateboarding. So, no, sir. I do, if you know, women want to wear makeup before they meet up with somebody. If you know. There are various reasons, I would say. Uh, of course, for the most part, in my opinion, most women want to look attractive. Uh, also, not just specifically for one person, but women just in general, just like want, they want to look attractive regularly. But we know that she was going to meet up with Jay King, right? Yes, sir. Because that's what she told her mother. Correct, sir. Not that she was going to meet Jay King, but she was put on makeup and she was going to go skateboarding. Correct. Correct, sir. You also talked to my client here, correct? Yes, sir. And um, you asked him about this investigation, correct? Correct, sir. Isn't it true that he said that he never sexually assaulted anyone? Can look through my notes real quick, sir. And that would be on page seven of eight on Wednesday, June 17, 2020. You're correct, sir. Pass the witness. May we approach? Yes. Detective Benavides, uh, Mr. Cantrell mentioned in his last questions to you um, whether you spoke to uh, Alexis Morganfield. Do you remember that question? Yes, sir. Did you give um, offer to Mr. Morganfield the opportunity to give a full statement? Yes, sir. Did he take you up on that offer? Yes or no? No, sir. Mr. Cantrell asked you whether you were surprised that there was no DNA evidence in his case. You remember that question? Yes, sir. Um, were you surprised? No, sir. Why not? The same kit was done the day after the uh, date of the offense. Sir. It did you have an opportunity to review the same 
report. Yes, sir. And um, the state nurse already testified and she testified the fact that it, it was about 18 hours afterwards um, that she had her SANE exam after the sexual assault. Based on that time frame, would you expect to find DNA evidence? As no, sir. Answered, Your Honor. Overall. You can answer that question. Uh, no, sir. So when you got the crime lab results back that there was no DNA, that did not surprise you? No, sir. He asked you a lot of questions about basically the victim's statement. Um, and um, and even the victim's mom's statement. In this case, after receiving, I should go back. When you have a case and you fully investigated it, investigate it, do you have to send it over to the DA's office? No, sir. If if you do not have evidence or do you do not believe a crime is committed, do you submit those cases to the Bear County DA's office? No, sir. And in this case, after completing your investigation, did you submit the case to the DA's office? Yes, I did, sir. So knowing all of those things that you've talked about on cross-examination, you still submitted this case to the DA's office? Yes, sir. In this case, did, other than providing a statement, did the victim give you other any other information? She emailed me uh, other information. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, did that include any videos? Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. That'll be overruled. Yes, sir. Uh, did you receive a uh, a video uh, of Mr. Morgan Fields? Um, that is a phone call between objection, Your Honor. FaceTime call between Sarah and Alexis Morgan Field. Yes, sir. Okay. And did you review that? Yes, sir. And did you consider that also? And when you uh, sent this case to the DA's office? Yes, sir. I'll pass the witness. Defense. Detective, your your job is is not to decide who's guilty or not, right? That's correct, sir. That's up to the jury here, right? That is correct, yes, sir. And you have no idea what the testimony of um, prior witnesses have said, isn't that right? No, sir. That, that is correct, sir. Um, ev evidence in a case is just evidence in a case, right? It's for a fact finder to determine whether it's accurate, truthful, or not, along with the judge. Correct, yes, sir. So, when you make the comment that it was 18 hours later, um, yourself and uh, Officer uh, Sandoval urged her to go and get her, uh, but actually you're at, at your time when you interviewed her, the, um, the same exam had already occurred, right? That, that's correct, yes, sir. Um, but you were aware that uh, Officer Sandoval encouraged her to go as soon as possible to get the same exam? Yes, sir. It was her choice not to do that. Correct, sir. Um, and actually, you have you have you have no knowledge whatsoever as to how long um, DNA evidence might be uh, um, reliably obtained. Right? You're not an expert in that area. No, sir. So when you testified that um, you weren't surprised, it's basically what you know basically is that, you know, if you want to get good results, go to the doctor right away, right? The, the sooner the better, yes, sir. Um, and that's just common sense. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. I have no further questions. All right, is this witness excused or subject for recall? Uh, we'd ask that he be uh, excused. Excused, Your Honor. All right, the rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone. You can only speak to attorneys for the state and the defense. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right, state, call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. State calls Veronica Barta. Can you raise your right hand for me? Do you solemnly swear from the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. All right, just have a seat. Uh, please keep your voice up so that the court report and the jurors can hear. If you can state your name for the record, please. My name is Veronica Barta. All right, state. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Barta, how are you employed? I'm employed with Bear County Pretrial Services. Okay. And what is Bear County Pretrial Services? Bear County Pretrial Services is the entity that monitors or supervises defendants who are out on bond for the city of Bear County. Okay. So you monitor people who have not been at that point convicted of anything? 
of their pending cases, correct. So um, when you supervise somebody, is it fair to say you're just ensuring that whatever conditions of bond are there in compliance? Correct. I'm just there to ensure that the conditions of bond are abided by. Um, yes, I'm not there to determine guilt or innocence or true or not true or anything like that. So logically, is it fair to say that if somebody's under your supervision, they're not in custody? Correct. Um, and your interactions with them, um, are they, um, actually, are you a law enforcement officer? I'm not a law enforcement officer. I'm not a peace officer. No, sir. And when you talk to somebody, are they free and willing to talk to you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. In any way they please. <laughs> okay. Um, in this case, um, as it relates to the cause that we're here for today, at some point were you um, Alexis Morganfield's uh, pretrial supervision officer? I was from roughly October of 2021 to February of 2022. And I should kind of go back. How long have you been with pretrial services? Since March of 2021. Your interactions with Alexis and Morgan Field, um, typically were they in person, over the phone? All of our interactions were over the phone or um, through email. Okay. Um, but nevertheless, you knew who Alexis Morgan Field was? Yes, sir. And at some point he was on your caseload? Yes, sir. Um, as it relates to this case and in this, this victim, um, did Mr. Morganfield make any incriminating statements to you? There was a time just before he was taken off my caseload, I guess you could say, um, that he got really upset. He sent me a bunch of text messages just venting from everything, covering topics. I don't know why I'm on this GPS, um, stating that he didn't understand the terms. He stated he didn't understand why he didn't have any clout in the situation because he was the rapper. And then he also stated he didn't understand how this could be assault if the girl went down on him. So he told you that, uh, how can it be an assault if this girl went down on me? Correct. And when he made that statement, was he in custody? No, he was not. Um, did you ask him to make any statements about this case? Absolutely not. We actually pushed defendants not to tell us anything about their case because we have nothing to do with it. I'm not law enforcement. I'm not an attorney. I'm not anything with the court um, in that sense. So we encouraged them not to talk to us about their, their cases. And was this statement given to you freely and voluntarily? Absolutely freely and voluntarily, yes, sir. And in any way, did you elicit this response from him? No, absolutely or attempt not. to elicit this response. No, it was not something I would forget, but I definitely did not elicit it. No, sir. I'll pass the witness. Mike Defense. <clears throat> Officer Barta. In supervising people who are on bond, you come to learn a little bit of the details of what they're charged with. I mean, you, you can't do your job without finding out a little bit, at least, whether you want to or not, about what they're charged with. Isn't that a fair statement? That's a fair statement, yes, sir. Okay. And you were aware on the date of this alleged conversation, you were aware, at least in general terms, what Alex was accused of doing. I mean, there, there are several different ways to get sexual assault. You were aware of the specific form of sexual assault that he had been accused of. I was aware of his case. Unless I look up someone's case on KSAT or online or, or request a police report, I don't have access to further details unless I intentionally seek them out myself. Yes, sir. But you were aware that from the official charges. I was aware of his official charges. Yes, sir. You were of the official charges and had you had a chance to see his indictment? No, sir. You had not seen the indictment? No, sir. Okay. So you were not aware that the indictment accused him specifically of Palladio, uh, male, male sex organ, female male. You were not aware of that? No, sir. You, okay, okay. So you had not seen all the police reports that a criminal defendant would be at least be aware of if he's represented by a good attorney? Correct, I had not seen a police report. So he yes, was much more, you would say it's likely that he was much more of an expert on exactly what he was accused of than you were at the time. Could you restate the question or rephrase the question? I'm okay. not sure I understand. Can you tell me the approximate date of the statement that you're referring to? Um, roughly between February 10th and February 16th. 
of 2000 of 2000 and 22 22 so are you aware of when he was first arrested in this case no, like if i looked back i could tell you the date but he was on a previous officer caseload that i so took you knew over. he'd been on bond for a while correct would it surprise you to know that his case dates back a full year before you believe he made the statement it wouldn't surprise me no sorry. right okay and in that year is it reasonable that he would have learned what he was being accused of that, that a good attorney would have shared with him what's in the police reports i mean is, is it does it stand to reason that after a year a criminal defendant would know what they're what they're accused of i think it would stand to reason that it, initially right from the beginning he would know what he was accused of so if somebody is talking to you about a, com a complaint and he doesn't specify whether i did this or this is what i'm accused of doing then you have no way of differentiating in your mind whether he is admitting to anything or simply parroting what's in the allegations you wouldn't know which is which because you don't know the details of the case is that fair could you i can say slow that again? down i can back up a little bit i'm sorry <laughs> i'm getting real complicated if i was in english class my teacher would be bleeding blood red all over my sentence <laughs> so i'll try again i'm sorry if a defendant under your caseload knew what he was being accused of and was aware of what police were saying he did mm -hmm. and got really frustrated one day mm -hmm. is it possible that he may vent about an accusation in language sounding like a confession but actually venting about an accusation I think it's possible. Okay. Yes. And you didn't ask specific questions. Are you making a confession? You didn't ask that, did you? No, sir. That's okay. not my job. Okay. I understand. Now, earlier you were saying that in general, nobody has to talk to you. But if somebody is on your caseload, they are required to report in, correct? Correct. And if somebody's on your caseload, there are other reasons from time to time that you would have to have without going into detail that you would have to have um conversations with them just to maintain the relationship and keep keep everything on the up and up is that right. right yes sir and if a if if somebody is on pretrial services and has a pretrial services officer if that pretrial service or services officer calls them they're expected to answer the phone aren't they yes sir when alex made the statement that he made to you you cannot tell definitively whether he's talking about an allegation or whether he is burying his soul and making a confession. I think you already said that. I just want to be really clear. You can't know which one of those two things he was doing by his venting, by his statement. I don't have any way of knowing okay. this. Before this conversation, had Alexis Morgan Field ever shared frustrations about his case with you? Was this the first time he had shared his frustrations with you? No, sir. Okay. Had he ever shared with you that he believed he was being prosecuted unfairly? Not that I can recall, recall specific words. No, sir. I mean, I'm sure in some sense uh, he continuously under, like expressed that he didn't understand why he was on this in the first place, what his case was, or, you know. So it would be fair to conclude that he believed he was being treated unfairly at least on some level in some okay. cases it calls for speculation withdrawn no further questions all right state um mr stevenson talked about there is a necessity for mr morgan field to communicate with you in certain occasions right that, correct yes sir and are any of those occasions hey let's talk about your uh your offense? No. And um, are any of those occasions uh, you're talking about any underlying facts or even underlying charges necessarily of the case? No, sir. As it relates to your conversations with him, are they just related to making sure that he is compliant with conditions of bond? That's correct. Yes, sir. So none of it has to do with what he's charged with. No, sir. It's just what he's Not required to do. Correct. Yes, sir. And so in this case, 
again, were you, did you, any of this conversation that preceded this, did you talk about the charges? No, sir. Did you talk about the underlying facts of the case? No, sir. I don't know them. Okay. It, to this day, I don't. And that's when he made the statement of how can it be assault if she went down on me? Correct. I'll pass the witness. <clears throat> Officer Barda, I'm sure that there have been many memorable people you've had on your caseload from time to time. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing our client has been a memorable person for your caseload. But it seems like frustration can go both ways. Before this conversation that we're talking about here, right before that, did you not iterate to Alexis Morgan Field, you're a prisoner, you're a criminal? In your statements, before, right before that happened, having regard with his rights when he had to be home, when he didn't have to be home, did you not say you're a prisoner, you're a criminal, and instigate this? Not that I recall, no, sir. I don't recall ever calling a defendant a prisoner or a criminal. Um, so I even used the word client and guest or, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're taught to use defendant, but coming from my previous job experience, I use the word client still as, as much as I can. So you've never had the need to put a troubled client in their place? I don't feel the personal need to put clients in their place. No, sir. That's not my job. <laughs> no further questions. So that we're clear here. Did you call Mr. Morganfield names? Not that I recall. No, sir. Okay. Was that always necessarily reciprocated? Um, no. Okay. And in his frustrations, maybe he's confused. Did he use some... Uh, that's the phrase, impolite language towards you. Not that I recall specifically directly towards myself. Um, the two statements that I did state were the ones that stood out the most. Again, this was in February. The messages are not like they're on an old phone that I'm not able to access, or I would have proof of both of the conversation both ways. But I'll pass witness judge. No further questions. All right, is this witness excused or subject for recall? We ask that she be excused. We agree, Your Honor. Excuse. All right. The rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone except for attorneys for the state and defense. You may step down. State, call your next witness. Your Honor, at this time, the state rests. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the jury. Uh, I'm going to have you come back tomorrow at 1:30 p.m. Um, all right, we can be seated. Uh, defense, are you calling witnesses? We need to have a conference with our clients. Um, confidential conflict with our client where we make that decision. All right. So is there going to be any uh, thing special asked for the jury charge from either side? Just, I don't know if it's included, um, but just as the indecency counts, we ask that uh, sexual contact just be defined in the definitions just so that we make sure that it says above or below the clothes. All right, just give me a moment. Everyone have a, have a seat, please. All right, we're going to be back tomorrow with our regular docket at 9 a.m. Then we're going to start this jury trial up at 1.